Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask that you would open up these scriptures to us right now. Lord, I pray that you would help me to clearly and effectively teach the doctrine of tongues according to the Bible. Lord, I pray that you would help us to understand its purpose, its sign, uh, how it applies to the Christian life in the New Testament. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be able to defend the doctrine biblically and to have an answer to those that are confused about this. Lord, I just ask that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit. I trust that you'll answer my prayer. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Listen, go to everybody. Preach salvation to everybody. Everybody needs to know. And it's awesome how that after, when Jerusalem was judged as this began to happen, they reject their Savior. Fulfilled prophecy was happening. It wasn't just the event at the cross. You think about it. The birth of Christ was an, was an answer to prophecy. It was fulfilled prophecy. Major men of God at the time, Simeon, upheld the baby Christ. Right? There were, there were many people that knew this was an answer. The king knew this was an answer. He's killing children. Everybody knew something was going on. John the Baptist is doing his ministry. Jesus does his ministry. Then they put him to death. He dies on the cross. He's, he resurrects, and here's the last thing he says, after ministering for another 40 days, and all these thousands of people saw I witness, he says, and I want you to go to every creature. He's talking about in other cities. He says, don't just keep it here in Jerusalem. You need to take it elsewhere to other nations, other cities where they don't speak your tongue. He says, if they believe, they will be saved. He says in verse 17, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. In the name of the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, he says, I'll give you victory over devils. He says, they shall speak with new tongues. Notice it doesn't say they will be speaking in tongues. It doesn't say they'll be slain in the Spirit. The Pentecostal movement as we have it today, I don't believe they understand the biblical doctrine of tongues as Jesus taught it, as Paul teaches it, as Acts teaches it, as Peter. I don't think they understand the truth about it. Here he's saying, with new tongues. Listen, we all speak English, right? Some of us well and some of us poorly, okay? <laughs> we all speak a little bit of English, right? Some lower Georgia, lower Alabama English, if you will, right? And thank God for what we do yeah. comprehend, because really it's about understanding. If you didn't understand any English, this conversation wouldn't be happening right now. Right. Brother Eli visits with us occasionally. Uh, his first language is Spanish. He has a hard time comprehending everything. His wife's with us. He's trying to learn English. He's trying to force himself, but it's hard when his brain's trying to catch up and his understanding's not there. He doesn't get the doctrine. He doesn't understand the different uh, nuances of language. It's hard for him to, to grasp all of that, right? I feel for the guy. Well, here, he's saying, I'm going to send you elsewhere and you'll speak with new tongues. Now imagine if the Lord uh, was here with us tonight and he said, you're going to Germany, you're going to Mexico, you're going to France. I'll go to Hawaii, I don't mind, you know, right? But he says, I'm going to send you all around the world. You're going to speak with new tongues. You're going where they're speaking another tongue, and you'll speak that new tongue. Now, you as a disciple, if you were Peter, like me, you'd probably say, but Lord, I'm, I'm an old man, and I'm slow to speak and slow to learn, and how am I supposed to learn some new language? That, that's going to take years upon years. I can download the course. I can start studying now. It'll take me a while to integrate and learn the language. No, he says, no, I'm going to send you, and everyone you preach to that believes this will get saved. You will speak with new tongues. Now, this is a promise of Jesus. I'm sending you to a new country. You will learn their language and the promise was that he would help. It would be a miracle. Look at verse 18. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. These are all things that the Lord also fulfilled in their ministry. We see it, obviously, uh, with Paul when he picked up the sticks and a snake bit him. And they, they worshipped him as God. And he said, I'm not the God. Let me tell you about God, right? And so, again, all these things were fulfilled. Verse 19. So after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. How did he confirm the word with signs? I want you to know this. Tongues is a sign. Rather, I'm going to say it like this. Tongues was a sign. 
tongues or languages of another language was a sign in how God operated. Go to Acts chapter 2. This is the most famous place where we see mentions of speaking with other languages in the Bible. If I did an exhaustive study of tongues or the word tongue in the Bible, there wouldn't be enough time. But I can tell you this, that it's in the Old Testament. It always means language. Yes. Every single time it means language. And I'm going to tell you this, in the New Testament, guess what? It also always means a language. Understandable, comprehensible language. This is so important because people that say they speak in tongues often mean somebody says something, I don't understand it, and that must be of God. But we never see such a thing happen in the Bible. In fact, the only people that would give us an indication that, that it's something crazy or mad or sounds like a drunken person are the scoffers that don't believe that don't get saved. It's always those outside of the camp that hear this sign and they say, well, that's not right, that's not supernatural. Some hear it and get, and get saved because tongues was a miracle for the comprehension of the gospel. If the Lord put me in Mexico and my Spanish was so poor, you speak Spanish, poquito, <laughs> very, very, very little, right? I've got, I've got, no, I can't, I can, I can, I can order taco, burrito, right? It would take a miracle for me to preach the gospel right now as I am in Mexico. And you know what? God could do that if he wanted. Yeah. Now, look, I'm not going to limit God and put him in a box and say, today he will not do that. No, God can do whatever he wants, right? As we say, he won't lie. Right? You can limit him yourself if you have a lack of faith. Here we see where they are scattered. And they're scattered, and, but before the scattering, we're going to see in Acts as uh, when Jesus said to wait for the promise, there was a major miracle going to happen 10 days after Christ had ascended. We're in Acts chapter 1. I'm sorry, Acts chapter 2. Look at verse number 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they all with one accord in one place... And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. I have been in a Pentecostal church service where somebody quotes this and takes the microphone and goes, what? and I'm just, that's not what this verse means. It, okay, it doesn't come from the speaker. It, it doesn't come from the, the PA system. It doesn't come from the microphone. This is from heaven. Right? What's about to happen is the promise from heaven. This is a miracle from heaven. God's about to reveal the mighty power that's found in the gospel, in the simplicity of the gospel. Acts chapter 2 is a great passage for the gospel, and yet it's known primarily for tongues. So this mighty wind coming from heaven, verse 3, it says, And there appeared, now appearance, appearance, is that what sound or is that eyes? Eyes, work with me here. Appearance. There appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. Now, a uh, uh, cloven. I, I believe we're talking about like what looks like a split tongue. I believe we're looking what looks almost like a tongue of fire above their head that appears to somebody. Has anybody ever seen a Pentecostal speaking in tongues and there was fire over their head? No. But this happened one time, you're right. This great day of Pentecost, 10 years after the Lord had ascended to heaven, and he did this as a sign. Fire over their head, all of the disciples that were preaching here. Verse 4, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. To utter something means you're saying it. You're uttering words as it comes out of your mouth. He says, so the Holy Spirit gave them words. The Holy Spirit, it says, uh, they began to speak with other tongues. Notice it doesn't say they were speaking in some tongue. It doesn't say they were speaking with tongues of angels. It says they spake with other tongues. Now, if Brother Doug were here or or a brother Chad, one of you, one of the guys that do speak in other tongues. I know some of you ladies, young ladies, speak a little bit of other tongues, right? If I could say, "Hey, I need somebody to speak something in another tongue," you would say, "Oh, well, I have uh, Spanish, I have Pig Latin, we can speak some Germany, you know, whatever your other tongue is." I would defer that to you. I could ask Brother Mike to give us a little bit of uh, Russian, uh, perhaps, or 
You see, so I could, we could speak in another tongue. That's what he's saying here. They began to speak in other tongues. These are men that primarily spoke one language, and all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit filled them. There was fire over their head. Everybody's looking around because they hear this sound from heaven, and then here come the apostles with fire over their head, and they're speaking the language, the native tongue of all the visitors that came back for this 50th year anniversary, this Pentecost. Look at verse 5. They were dwelling at Jerusalem. Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Right? So at, for the Pentecost, all these people came back. They were from every nation all around the world. They came to Jerusalem for this, mo this moment. Now, when it says devout men, these were people that were searching for the Lord. These were people that believed in God. They would have known of the coming of the Messiah. They would have heard the prophecies. And now it's like they're coming to hear, hear I believe, the fulfillment of all these prophecies. Verse 6. Now then, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. It doesn't say they were confounded or amazed or confused. It doesn't say that, that they were confounded because they didn't understand them. It says they were confounded because who are these men speaking in our language? Imagine somebody that's lived in Asia for multiple generations. And here they come back for this Pentecost. And they and their children have been speaking that natural dialect and learning what was local over there. And they come back and these regular old guys start speaking in the words that they understand best. That's the miracle of the Holy Spirit. The speaking in other languages or speaking with other tongues was a miracle always for preaching the gospel. We're filled with the Holy Spirit to preach the gospel. This is not evidence of your salvation. Some try to use that and say, well, oh, you're not saved until you get that gift. You got to get that extra gift, you know, the, the extra blessing. Or, there's several phrases people use for that, but the Bible doesn't teach that. Look at verse 7. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? Aren't these those old country boys? Why do they sound like, like us, right? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Now, this right here, these two verses in verse 6 and 8 should be enough to give a biblical definition to a Pentecostal that wants to tell you, I speak with other tongues. I speak with tongues of angels. Now, when somebody says that, who are they giving glory to? Themselves. I have this great gift that you don't have. Well, we have Sunday school at 10. We have the Spirit-filled service at 1130. Really? What do you mean by that? Think about it. They're trying to boast of gifts that they don't have, like clouds without rain. I have some supernatural gift that the Bible doesn't even teach. According to this, we're dealing with somebody that God gave them the ability to speak a language that was understood to the hearer that they had never formally learned as a, as a human being, as a man. This is supernatural. This is a miracle. He goes on and gives us a list. He says, Parthians and Medes and Elamites, dwellers of Mesopotamia, in Judea, Cappadocia, and Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya, and Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, and Jews, and proselytes, Cretes, and Arabians. We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. That's like 18 languages. They're like all these different people from different parts. They all hear in their very own language in their dialect. This was a miracle of God for the gospel's sake. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, what meaneth this? Now they're, I don't get it. How come this is happening? And, and I don't want to spend all day on this chapter. I wish I could, but I want to be brief about this. I mean, clearly, he goes on and he preaches the gospel. In fact, look at verse 21. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. He goes on and he preaches Jesus Christ and the prophecies that David told of him. And he said, this is the Holy One. This is. He's resurrected. We put him to death. And he is very God. I want you to turn to Acts 21. Acts 21. Again, for the sake of time, I'm going to keep it as short as I can, but I really do want to cover this doctrine thoroughly. I almost 
uh, went to my computer and printed out all the verses. I just wrote down a couple things, and we're going to look at what the Lord's leading me at here, which is tongues are a sign for preaching the gospel. It was a sign back then, but what we hear of today is not the biblical speaking with other tongues or speaking with a new tongue as Jesus himself taught us. Look at the end of the chapter. You're in Acts chapter 20, verse 37. And as Paul was to be led into the castle, he said unto the chief captain, May I speak unto thee? Who said, Canst thou speak Greek? If you underline in your Bible, or if you highlight, go ahead and get that one right there. Can you speak Greek? All right, that's verse 37. Paul's being led into the castle, and he asked the captain, May I speak unto thee? Who said, Canst thou speak Greek? So the captain turned to Paul and said, Can you speak Greek? Art thou not an Egyptian, which before these days made, madest an uproar, and led us down into the wilderness, 4,000 men that were murderers? All right, he's got the wrong guy. But Paul said, I am a man, which am a Jew of Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city, no, he means lowly, of no mean city, and I beseech thee, suffer me to speak unto the people. When he had given him license, Paul stood on the stairs and beckoned with the hand unto the people. And when there was made a great silence, he spake unto them in the Hebrew tongue, saying, two things happening here. Paul first speaks in Greek, and then now in Hebrew. I am not saying that this passage is teaching us of the gift of the Holy Spirit and speaking with other tongues, I'm just demonstrating that the Bible's usage of the word tongue here is talking about first Paul speaking in Greek, now he's going to speak in Hebrew. When the Bible uses the word tongue, it's a known, recognizable, understandable, comprehensible language. Comprehension is key. That's what it's all about. Go to 1 Corinthians 12. Jump ahead to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. When somebody says they speak with tongues or in tongues or uh, the one that I uh, don't like to hear the most is when they start saying, I speak with tongues of angels. Talk about boasting of a false gift. Now, what's the tongues of angels? We're going to cross that path in just a second, but let's just logically work through this. We've just seen the tongue of the Greeks, right? The, the Parthians, the Medes, the Elamites, the Mesopotamians, Phrygia, Pamphylia, right? We've got this whole list and we've got the Hebrew tongue, the Greek tongue, those are all people languages. Now, people dwell on earth. I'm going to make it real simple. Angels dwell in heaven. Do they communicate? Well, obviously. Do they have their own language? Because when they come down and speak to us, they speak in our native tongue. Yeah. Right? Think about this. Throughout time, in different prophets, they spoke different languages. But when God sent an angel, or when the, when the angel of the Lord showed up to speak to the prophet... He spoke their language. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the power of the Holy Spirit. He speaks all languages, right? So angels in heaven have their own language. And when God sends an angel down to us, we hear it in our own tongue. The same miracle that we saw on the day of Pentecost. They were speaking and those heard it in their own tongue. They understood, they comprehended. Can you imagine when Moses spoke with the Lord, if he had to get an interpreter to understand God? Like God's not big enough to speak his language? Mm. You think about that. God obviously comes, he speaks in our own language yeah. for our benefit so that we're edified, so that we know what he wants us to hear. You're in 1 Corinthians 12. I just want to glance at this because uh, tongues, which speaking in other languages and interpreting other languages is a gift. I do believe that the Lord can still... Um, benefit and give these talents and gifts to individuals today, but it's obviously far, far, far from what it was then. God did something so miraculous. They hear things in heaven. They see fire. They're speaking to a crowd of people, and all the people hear their own language. That in itself was a huge miracle. I know people like to debate, well, was it in the hearing or the speaking? Hey, it was in the Holy Spirit. Mm, yeah. It was in God's Spirit speaking, because when God speaks to us, we hear Him. We don't have a problem hearing him. He speaks very clearly. Here in 1 Corinthians 12, uh, this is where it deals with spiritual gifts and some administrations and stuff. Look at verse 10. He says, To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. That's preaching. To another, discerning of spirits. 
to another, diverse kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. Listen, when a church is a full body with all the body parts present, you're begin to, going to begin to have people, some that do well at speaking in other languages, others that can be that bridge and interpret languages. Some would say, I, I can hear what you're saying, I just can't say it. Or I know how to say it, but <laughs> don't ask me to write it down. Right? There's different aspects of learning. And obviously these are dealing with spiritual gifts. Jump ahead to verse 28 at the end of the chapter. And God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Now listen, if this church ever got so large it was the size of a mega church, hey, maybe we would have all of these different aspects here, but the Lord builds the church as He sees fit. He gives us what we need for a certain time. We have, well, we don't have apostles, we have prophets, we have teachers. We've had miracles in this church. That's of the Lord. Those are His gifts. Are, are, look at verse 29. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Have all the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? Notice there they're tied together. Speaking and interpreting are things that should go together. But covet earnestly the best gifts. Ooh, what's that? He's saying there's a best gift. You ought to have that. And yet I show you a more excellent way. The answer to that question is prophecy. Prophecy is the best gift. Look at chapter 13, verse number 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and the tongues of and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or as a tinkling cymbal. Now he's writing this to the Corinthians because they're amazed. How do you speak in, the, in our language here in Corinth? Everybody's hearing, we, we see this gift that you have. And so he's like, you think I'm speaking with the tongue of an angel. But what he's saying is, it's the power of the Holy Spirit, just as the tongue of an angel, who everybody can hear when it's spoken. But his point here that if I'm not loving, then what good does it do? If I'm not loving about how I instruct you and teach you, then all of these gifts from God are almost pointless. In fact, jump ahead to verse 8 in chapter 13. He says, Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. You know, languages have ceased to exist. You know, I believe in part here we're seeing that the gift of tongues as it was on the day of Pentecost, that also has ceased. Yeah. It does not exist like it was then. It's not the same. Jump ahead to chapter 14. Look at verse number 1. Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. He says it's good to desire all those gifts and have the Lord will give you more, take more, but the number one thing is to be able to preach. And that doesn't just mean get behind the pulpit. That means telling other people about the Lord Jesus Christ. Preaching the gospel, helping others enter into the kingdom of heaven, helping others receive forgiveness of sins. He says rather that you may prophesy. Hey, we're given the Holy Spirit for boldness, to prophesy. Every one of you in here is capable of prophesying through the Holy Spirit to get someone saved. Yeah. Look at verse 2. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men but unto God. For no man understandeth him. Howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. If I'm having a conversation with a gentleman here and we're both speaking in German mm -hmm. and none of you understand German, mm -hmm. it's a mystery to you, isn't it? You don't comprehend it. You don't understand it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's still a language. It's unknown to you. In fact, certain languages, if we heard it, like maybe certain Slavic dialects or certain Asian dialects, we might hear it and we could say, I don't know, I think it's Asian, but I don't know which one. Oh, yeah. How do you know? Is it this? Is it, I don't know, but I could guess maybe the region perhaps if you've heard enough but it's still unknown to you, especially the comprehension of what they're actually saying, right? It's unknown to the hearer. Verse 3, He that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification. When you're preaching to somebody, you're edifying them. That's lifting them up, building them up. And exhortation, that's challenging them to do better, to do more. And comfort. When I preach, I mean, there's three things we can talk about in preaching. It's to encourage you. It's to challenge you. It's to comfort you through hard times. Verse 4, He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. 
But he that prophesieth edifieth the church. The point here is if you're speaking in an unknown tongue, you're not preaching to the hearer. If I'm preaching at you in another language, you don't know if I'm talking on the phone. You ever had that where you think somebody's talking to you and they're on the little Bluetooth? You know what I mean? Oh, hey, yeah, me? Are you waving at me? Are you talking? What? What are you talking about? You know, you're like, oh, they're on a headpiece. Wouldn't that kind of be the case? If I just started speaking in German, in German, and I'm looking at you and you're like, is he mad at me? Is he telling me I did a good job? I don't know what he's saying. You see, you understand? And so what he's saying is, if, if you're preaching, there's comprehension and understanding. Yeah. If you're speaking in another language, you're not doing anybody any good. You're not comforting them. You're not encouraging them. You're not exhorting them. And that is a one big difference between prophesying and speaking with tongues. And again, for the sake of time, let me cut this down just a little bit. Let's see, uh, verse 6, Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues... What shall I profit you? In other words, how's it going to help you? Except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine. Again, comprehension, understanding. And even things without life, giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? If we let one of the children get on the piano... What are they? <laughs> I had a child recently. Dad, look, I put this letter and that letter and this letter. What's it spell? Nothing. <laughs> right? That's what it would sound like if we, if we let an untalented hand hit the piano. We wouldn't know what they're trying to come across with. Right? He says in verse 8, For if the trumpet shall give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? So likewise ye, look at this verse 9, So likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For you shall speak into the air. You're talking to yourself if they don't understand what you're saying. I used to own a computer store, and sometimes people would come in and ask me questions. And I mean, I'm a nerd. I like information. And I would explain how the bus was working with the processor and the chip and on the board and then you have and and, and people would just go I, uh, and so hey, hey Adam, you're going way over their head just tell them it doesn't work okay <laughs> they, they don't have to explain where and how and what happened and what might have been just it's okay just you know what i mean you think about it, if if somebody's get overly technical with you you're just like i don't know man you lost me a long time ago keep it simple would you well in the same way with our gospel if you don't if you just want to talk in the air and talk to yourself driving down the road that's not helping anybody. But with our tongue, we should speak words easy to be understood. Keep your speech simple. Keep it clear. Make sure your doctrine is understood. How can I give you revelation? How can I reveal something to you? How can I give you knowledge? Except we're speaking the same language, and it's easy to understand. That is so important. He says in, uh, jump ahead to verse 14. Actually, look at verse 13. He says, Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. In other words, if God's preaching, make sure that you understand what you're saying. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. Here's the goal. Understanding. If your understanding is unfruitful, if I got up here and made noises for 30 minutes, your understanding would be unfruitful. You wouldn't gain anything from it. You wouldn't learn anything. You wouldn't see what the Lord has for you. And that's a similar comparison. If we all went tonight and visited the Vietnamese church, we would just be like, wow, that was different. What'd you learn? I don't know. I learned that I don't know Vietnamese. That's what I learned, right? And you think about that. That's not how church should be. Everything should be decently and in order is how he ends the chapter. He's trying to tell us that when we speak, it needs to be clear. It needs to be understood. Look at verse 19. Yet in the church, I had rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. I could read a paper to you in German, you wouldn't understand it, and then I said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that you can understand. That can help you. That is profitable. Look at the next verse, verse 20. Brethren, be not children in understanding, Howbeit in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. In the law it is written, With men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people. 
And yet for all that will they not hear me, saith the Lord. I believe this is a prophecy here where you're seeing other disciples that spoke another language. What do they do? Because you think about it when, in Acts, you see them. They go to another city. They get somebody saved. And all of a sudden, the locals that were not Jews go to the synagogue. They speak another language. And now they're filled with the Holy Spirit. They speak in tongues and the Jews hear them in the synagogue. Think about it. You've got people that are given the, the power of speaking tongues for the sake of the gospel. Look at verse 21 again. In the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people. And yet for all that will they not hear me, saith the Lord. Wherefore, tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe. Why don't we, why don't we all speak in another language in church? It's not for us. We already believe. Tongues aren't for those that believe. He says, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not. I can't go and preach to somebody that doesn't believe on Jesus and them understand these doctrines. These are spiritual things. They need the Holy Spirit so they're spiritually discerned. He says, but for them which believe. Preaching is for those that already believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Tongues was used to go to foreigners so they can know to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't put the cart before the horse. God did a miraculous thing with tongues. And what we have today is confusion. And I think it's almost apostasy. I think it's very dangerously something that is used by the devil where people jump up and down and beat their chest and say, look at me, I have a gift. I have a word for you. Me, 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 me. They teach you can lose your salvation. Listen, this is a very dangerous movement. Look at verse 27. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most by three and that by course and let one interpret if we had missionary day and we all and we had three missionaries that all spoke other languages one guy at a time with an interpreter no exceptions we don't get three languages going in here all at the same time that none of us understand one guy with an interpreter the next guy with an interpreter if there's no interpreter he shouldn't speak look what he says verse 28 but if there be no interpreter let him keep silence in the church and let him speak unto himself and unto God. Let the prophets speak two or three and let the other judge. It's important for us to judge these things. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. Again, proving the first guy's talking. He says, hey, the Lord's given me a message. Hold on. Well, then let me sit down before you stand up and start talking. If you've ever seen a Pentecostal experience, half the room, mostly women, talking and jabbering and jumping and yelling and screaming. This is not how church was ever run in the Bible. He says in the next verse, look at this, this is so important, verse 31, for ye may all prophesy one by one, that ye may all learn and all may be comforted. Even when we go out preaching the gospel door to door and we're prophesying, two men together or two ladies, a team together. My wife goes out with me sometimes and all the kids, you know what? She doesn't start talking while I'm talking. In fact, if she has something to say to the person, yeah, go ahead and I'll be quiet and she can speak one at a time, decently and in order. You may all prophesy, but one at a time. This is so important. Mm. Verse 32, and the spirits of the prophets are subject unto the prophets. This is a great verse. Me as a man of God behind the pulpit preaching the word of God, and I am a prophet of God. I'm opening the Bible and telling you what he said. I'm prophesying. I'm not trying to put any weight on myself. I'm not trying to uh, boast of a gift or anything. But here's what I'm telling you. Anybody that stands behind a pulpit, they're subject to these prophets. All the prophets before me, what they have said, it goes above me. What I say, if I speak in error, I submit to the word of God. This is the authority. These are the prophets that I'm judged by. You need to know these prophets because I'm going to misspeak. I'll make a mistake. I may learn something over time and look back and say, you know what, I was wrong on that. But I think I see a more excellent way through the prophets, through the scriptures. This is the authority, not some, I got a word from you. Yeah. Verse 33, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Amen. Listen, he's, the, he's not the author of confusion. It shouldn't be confusing. It should be peaceful. Verse 34, let your women keep silence in the churches. Uh-oh, just lost half, y'all. Probably not in here so much. Why is this in here? 
Is it because God doesn't like women? No. No. God wants things in order. Sometimes maybe women are more emotional and they should ask, wait and ask their husband at home and say, and say hey, wait a minute, Pastor, what did you mean by that? Hey, hold on a minute. There's a way. Ask your husband. Let me finish and maybe you'll understand. Look at it. Verse 34. Let your women keep silence in the churches for it is not permitted on them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience as it also saith in the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. And all it's saying here is a woman should not usurp the authority of a man. God made a man first. We're made in the image of God, who obviously is a man. He's the Father, the Son. Uh, the Holy Spirit's called a He. And it, again, it's not because God doesn't like women or oppresses women. In fact, I don't like men that oppress women. That's not right according to the Scriptures. We're supposed to love our wife and forgive our wife and defend our wife and lay our life down for our wife. And they submit under us. And they say, when you get home, they say, hey, uh, you know you said that? Is that? Do you really think that's the right answer? And you go, oh, yeah, thanks for that wise counsel. I believe God's given us all the wise counsel we need. If God's given you a wife, I believe it's, it's one that we need to balance out. It's like a balancing factor in life. You leave us men to ourselves, we'll do some dumb stuff, right? right. You leave the women to themselves, they'll get pretty emotional. Then I all weeping in the corner together or something. I don't know. And I'll pick it on you. Sorry. But yeah. you know what I mean? I mean? Think about it. Maybe us men, we'd be too tough and we wouldn't have any place for any emotion. And the women would just be all emotion and no logic. And God balances all that out. He wants us to have a perfect body. He wants us, our, our church to be perfect and in order. And so there's a place for women to keep silence in the church instead of them getting up here and usurping the authority. You think about how absurd it would be if a, if a woman just came up and said, no, pastor, that's not how it's preached. Let me preach it. Get out of my way. I'd say, whoa, we got a problem. You can't usurp my authority. This is God's church. It's his pulpit. It's his word. And he's put me in charge right now. You can't usurp, usurp my authority. Now, if I usurp the authority of the Bible, God can use a woman to rebuke me. And he has, and he will. And hey, God may judge our country by putting a woman in charge to, to show the shame of America. God may very well do that to us. Verse 36, what? Came the word of God out from you? Or came it unto you? If any man think him to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. He's trying to tell you, listen, if you, don't, if you think you're a prophet and you're spiritual, but you don't recognize that only one person can speak in the church at a time, and he has to have an interpreter, and women can't get up and preach to everybody in the church, it should be the men that do that job, and they do it subject to these prophets, the Word of God. If it's out of that order, get it out of the church. He says, you think you're somebody, you don't do that, you're wrong. He says in verse 38, but if any be ignorant... Let him be ignorant. If, any man, if, you, if a man wants to be ignorant, oh, I don't know about that. I keep it simple. You shouldn't be ignorant, but now, now you've made yourself ignorant. There's, wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy. I love this verse. We're, we're told not to be covetous. But here we are. Covet to prophesy. Do you remember how he ended, what was it, chapter 12, verse 31, but covet earnestly the best gifts? And yet I show unto you a more excellent way. See, I want to covet the best gifts. What were those? Well, we, he said, verse chapter 14, 1, rather that ye prophesy. Now we're at the end of chapter 14, and he says in verse 39, Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy, covet to prophesy, and forbid not to speak with tongues. There's a place for tongues and languages in a church. But it has to be decently, in order, with an interpreter, one at a time, not by a woman. There's all these things that are lined up that if you go to any Pentecostal church, they will have those things wrong. Yep. They all have them wrong. Verse 40, let all things be done decently and in order. Listen, that's God's goal here. He's not the altar of confusion, but of peace. As in all the churches of the saints. And we just want to follow Him. We want to be subject to the prophets. And thank God He's made, given us a clear order. A clear order. We know what His will is when it comes to speaking with tongues. He made it very evident for us. And let me just end with this, where we started. In Mark chapter 16 at the end, where He gives the Great Commission. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. If they don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, they're already damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, and they shall speak with new tongues. Listen, I think it's a great thing when missionaries 
Baptist missionaries take the gospel of Jesus to other countries. I think that's still a great thing. It's still, I think one reason why, maybe why God has been merciful to America is the number of missionaries we've sent out over the years. Tongues are a sign that I believe has passed. It's not the same as it was in the Pentecost, the day of Pentecost. And those that have great faith in these signs and wonders, the Bible warns of lying signs and wonders, used to deceive people. And it's our job as a Christian to stand up and defend the Word of God and show them what the Bible says. Acts chapter 2, uh, 1 Corinthians 14, both very clear about what it is and what it isn't. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your Word. Lord, thank you for the gift of languages that you've given in the past to help see others saved. Lord, if it wasn't for that gift and the preaching of the gospel, many of us probably wouldn't have heard the gospel. Lord, thank you for the miracles that you've worked. Lord, thank you for the opportunities we had today out soul winning.